At this very place 60 years ago, our emerging nation showed its true colours. On December 3rd, 1959, Singapore presented its new flag, new anthem and a new head of state. They were signs of a new era, symbolising our nation's founding principles, our highest ideals. To know what my country stands for, I'm going back to its start. Join me as I decipher the symbols that represent Singapore to the world. I'm an architect, so I'm fascinated with stories behind buildings. And the story of this building is epic. City Hall was front and centre in so many pivotal events in Singapore's history. I remember one particular moment when I had the chance to be part of the NDP at the Padang. I was standing right in the middle of the stage, the City Hall was in front of me, the national anthem was playing and everyone was singing in unison. That moment, was truly magical and the sense of patriotism was just amazing and undoubtedly so because the meaning of this place is beyond its architecture. It was also the scene of key moments in Singapore's journey to nationhood. In this room in City Hall on December the 3rd, 1959, Yusuf Ishaq succeeded Singapore's last British governor as head of state. It was a big step up for the former newspaper editor. From chronicling Singapore's development as a journalist, Yusuf Isha overnight became a state symbol. Just imagine Yusuf Isha standing here, facing a crowd of about 10,000 on the Padang. From here, he could see ships in the harbour as they sounded their horns to salute him. Against that backdrop, amidst the pomp and ceremony, Yusuf Isha knew he was handed a job that bore heavy expectations. The main task that lies before us now is the building of a united nation devoid of communal sentiments and suspicions. The complete interracial unity and national consciousness must be established if Singapore is to march forward towards peace and prosperity. In the past, no special efforts were made to develop a national consciousness and a sense of loyalty towards this country. But the old attitude and outlook must be changed and are changing. Those people who come to stay here have now realised the fact that there is but one country for them, Singapore. As head of state, he was looked upon to unite Singaporeans of all colours and creeds. Still, Yusuf Isha wasn't the unanimous choice for the job as biographer Dr. Noor Shahril Sa'ad discovered. Well, if you look at some of the declassified documents, there were debates, uh, who is Yusuf Ishaq? Because he may be known locally, but for the colonial government, he might be a, someone that requires further testing. So there were a lot of questions, what he stood for, whether he's Malayan born, what are his interests, what is his family background. Do you think he was the right person for the job? They could have migrated, but someone like Yusuf Ishaq believed in what the Singapore government stood for, that we are a small cosmopolitan country, we represent meritocracy, equality, and as a Malay himself, he understood the consequences of staying in Singapore, where he will become a minority. But his belief in the system, 
His belief in the values of multiracialism and equality made him stay. It was a time when lofty ideals like social harmony and multiculturalism, later to become hallmarks of the Singapore story, were still an aspiration. We were not even a nation. We were not united. The word Singaporeans did not even exist at that time. Civil servant Richard Tan grew up during those heady days of Singapore's past. So at the time, you need to quickly, quickly claim sovereignty. The moment you are given that sovereignty, that self-government, you have to come out with a symbol that will hopefully rally the people together and hopefully go out to the other country, to the UN, to showcase that this is now a sovereign state of Singapore. So was that why it's important then to have such state symbols? It was important because otherwise, what, what represents Singapore in the minds, in the perception of the country? People were living in Chinatown, in Geylang. Their own perception of who they are it was just that community, just that street. You know, so you elevate them. We are now no longer different community groups, different streets, but we are one country and you can proudly say you are Singaporean. He symbolizes all of us. To him, devotion and loyalty are due. Yusuf Isha embodied the values and aspirations of a new nation at the cusp of independence. Along with the head of state, other national symbols would have to be created in a hurry all serving to rally citizens towards a unified vision of Singapore. Okay, I'm gonna paste my last two stars on my flag, right? There are how many stars on our flag? Five! Five! Okay, last Five. two stars. Okay, there you go. There you go, I've completed my flag. You know, as a kid, I have probably drawn the flag countless of times, but I remember one particular incident when an art teacher reminded me that the stars had to be drawn equal in size, and I didn't quite understand why. The stars had to be drawn equal in size simply because each of the stars represent equal value and importance for our country. Okay, now I'm gonna hang my flag. Who's gonna help me? Let's go. <laughs> the state flag represents our country's founding values. But do Singaporeans know what the features on our flag mean? Do you know what the features of the flag represent? More like something they said. Democracy, is it? Friendship. Prosperity. Equality. Equality? Yes, equality, right? What about the crescent? The crescent is a, a young nation. White means pure purity. When you see the flag unfurling, what does it really mean to you? Symbolic. Uh, that, that, that is, it's, it represents we as one nation. A small country can do something big. It seems that the Singaporeans I met were struggling when I asked them about the meaning behind the features of our state flag. But what's really heartening to know is that the flag is still a very meaningful symbol to them and it gives them a sense of pride and it unites us as one people. But for Singaporeans who have had the honour of wearing our flag and representing the country abroad, what does the flag mean to them? So how has this visual symbol left a deep impression in your line of work or in the things that you do? For me personally, I think the deepest impression um, was in the 2008 Beijing Paralympic Games. Um, it was the very first time the flag 
was flown uh, in an Olympic arena and Majula Singapura was being played in an Olympic arena. And honestly, it still gives me goosebumps thinking about it. These moments uh, motivate me. I hope that and I know that one day I can get back there again. I want, I want the flag to be back up there and yeah, it really keeps me going. What about you, Karis? When I do relief missions in Philippines and, and Indonesia and countries that are very near Singapore, they kind of recognize where we are from just by looking at the flag. And sometimes you can even go to communities that are, you, that are so far away from the capital that you think that they do not know anything outside, right? But actually they see the flag and they will say, hey, you are from Singapore. And they can share with you how they feel about Singapore. And I can say that most of the times they will share good things about what we have. So in, in NDP's case, it's more like a, a, a unifying symbol to, to sort of focus our minds on the fact that, hey, we're now talking about this thing called Singapore. The flag is that visual symbol that unifies us in that conversation, that right now we're all looking and talking about the country that we belong to. And that's why it's a very powerful thing. In 1959, the task of designing the flag fell to Dr. To Chin Chai. To, a former academic, was Deputy Prime Minister. He had a blank slate, full autonomy, and only two months to come up with the design. I was in favour of one colour, red. But I knew I would not be able to get away with it because Again, red at that time was associated with the Communist Party. There were great sensitivities. We have to be very politically sensitive. Eventually, Cabinet decided on red and white. Red for universal brotherhood and equality. White for purity and virtue. But a very early concept had just three stars. For democracy, justice and equality. I was a bit anxious that putting three stars on a Singapore flag will lead to uneasiness among some people because the Malayan Communist Party also has three stars. Because of this, we added two more stars to represent prosperity and peace. Crescent Moon represents a newly independent country. At the same time, I showed the Malays, in particular the Muslims, that we are not a Chinese state. That was the, the circumstance in 1959 uh, when our pioneer leaders had to work so fast, you know, and to get the people together. Look, you are now citizen of the sovereign country of Singapore. You are now Singaporeans. It was later on that we started making sure that people actually respond to say, we are Singapore. We can stand up for Singapore. You can count on me, Singapore. In Singapore, the flag is an unmistakable feature in the month of August. But this wasn't always the case. Strict laws in the past had governed how, where, and when the flag could be displayed. It was Richard Tan in 1986 who campaigned to relax the laws. He came up with the idea for the flag's islet, now a standard feature in every public housing flat. Fortunately for me, HDV readily agreed to post-fit all the islet throughout the entire island. I remember they quoted a budget of $320,000 and they post-fit it, and that has become a standard feature for all newly built HDB flat until now. With the flag came an accompanying emblem, the crest, which functions as a coat of arms. If you look at the state crest, the way it's designed, it actually demonstrates our link to Malaysia, the lion and the tiger. And it was done deliberately, I suppose, if you look at it, to show our historical significance in this part of the world. What is the function of the state crest? State crest is an administrative crest, a seal of people like. This is a symbol of authority. It goes back to the old days of the aristocracy when they seal letters in wax, you know, with their own crest. 
but perhaps our most personal connection to the crest is its motto, Majula Singapura, Onward Singapore. A rallying cry and an aspiration which inspired our national anthem. A school day in Singapore starts the same way every day. But the morning ceremonies have added significance here at Cedar Gold Secondary. In 1959, it was one of the schools invited to the Padang to sing Majula Singapura when it was unveiled as the national anthem. When I was in school, I was a prefect and a school announcer, and I had to stand in front of everyone and sing the national anthem in front of the entire school almost every morning. So it became a routine for me, and some days a very dreadful thing to do because it's really hard to feel spirited and patriotic when there's so much things on your mind early in the morning. And I can see that in the faces of some of the students this morning. Orchestra conductor Joshua Tan shares my sentiments. Tan recently re-recorded the arrangement of the national anthem. We wake up really dreary-eyed in the morning, trot to school, and the only consolation we get hearing the national anthem is that we are not late for class. You were tasked with re-recording the national anthem. How did you approach it? It came from, from, from my heart and my feelings as a locally born and bred Singaporean. Uh, my experiences overseas uh, and what this country means to me and, and what the words mean. For myself, I've worked more than half of my adult life outside of Singapore. And ironically, that has made me much more Singaporean. Uh, it has made me appreciate more of what we have. When I'm overseas, you know, it makes me homesick. Uh, when I'm at a national event, I hear the anthem. It makes me very proud. Uh, it makes me very thankful to be born in this country. This re-recording, performed by the Singapore Symphony Orchestra, will debut on December the 3rd, 2019, 60 years after the anthem was first unveiled. So I wanted something that was much more upbeat and a little bit more inspiring. Not only so that people can, can sing to it, but also when they hear it, they'll say, wow, what, what, what a fantastic orchestra this is. And I particularly like this verse in the national anthem, Semua Kita Berseru, in a new spirit. It doesn't matter how young or how old this country is going to be, because every generation has got to have the new spirit. Unknown to many Singaporeans, this is not the first time Majula Singapura has been refreshed. In fact, its very first version was longer by eight full bars. Professor Bernard Tan witnessed its second public performance in 1959, before it became the national anthem. Zuberside had been commissioned by the city council in 1958 to write a piece, a song, for the reopening of the Victoria Theatre, which had been renovated. In 59, when the agreement for Singapore's self-government had been agreed on, the then mayor of the city council, Ong Eng Guan, okay, <laughs> we approached To Chin Chai, we, 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 we have a song already, ready for you. So apparently when To Chin Chai uh, heard the song and was given a song, he said, yeah, this will be good. But when the song had to be shortened to serve as an anthem, 
its composer almost had his masterpiece taken away from him. He had been asked by Cho Ching Chai to shorten the anthem, which he must have gone to do, but he hadn't submitted his version yet. He found out in some way that someone else had done the shortening without his authority, and it was not a good job, okay? And he wrote a letter, which was a very angry letter, to S. Rajaranam. And the day that he wrote the letter is the day that, was the day that the, the bill for the national anthem was going to the Legislative Assembly. The bill was withdrawn suddenly. And I can only surmise it must have been due to Zubasai's uh, protesting to S. Rajaratnam. Since 1959, the anthem has actually been rearranged a number of times. It was Tan who proposed perhaps its most radical tweak in the year 2000. I took the chance at the time since uh, I was the chairman of the committee to suggest something. And that was this. The original uh, version of the national anthem at the time was in the key of G major. So instead of today, it's... It was actually higher. Oh, that's harder to one sing. One tone, one tone higher. Mm -hmm. And if you have it in the key of G major, the highest note is an E, which, to tell the truth, I also can't sing. It's too high. <gasps> Not many can. Yeah. yeah, but it's a strain. Uh, let, let's put it this way. So I thought, you know, we could do something to help Singaporeans. Why don't we lower one tone down to key of F? And therefore, the E becomes a D. A lot easier to sing. Mm -hmm. So today, the key of the national anthem is F major. And the highest note is D because we changed the key at that point of time. That's a good call. I hope so, I hope so. Our national symbols are the very elements, the tangibles that we hold on to, to remind us of the intangibles, our common goals and our common aspirations. The symbols are there not to unite us as one homogenous people per se, but rather to unite us with our differences. All in all, this journey has further cemented my belief that our symbols were created to help us build that platform, to stand together as one people during good and bad times and feel proud as Singaporeans. Mm -hmm.